when the time comes to start some of your own seed, whether you want to get a jump on the season or just grow some new and interesting things in your garden during the growing season, you want to make sure you have all the things you need to be successful. So what I want to do is just share with you some basic tips that will put you in a better place for a greater garden. All right. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you've got a container to start the seed in. It's going to be a wide range of things. It can be a container that's plastic, flat like this, a trough. It can be peat pots, as you can see here. The main thing is that it's got to have good drainage. That's essential. So remember that. A few things to keep in mind with those containers is you want them really clean. So if it's not new, you're using something from the previous year, you want to make sure you disinfect it. So uh, some warm soapy water works or a dilute solution of bleach can really disinfect it completely and that's what you want. And you also want to use new soil, soil that doesn't have any seed or pathogens in it. I like to use a soil mix that's developed specifically for seedlings or these little peat discs that look like this when they're dry, but then when they expand, they pop open like that. They're really handy to have. So soil is very important as well. Now timing is very important, particularly if you're trying to get ahead of the season because you don't want to grow all these things and them be ready to go in the ground and it be too cold out. So if you look on the back of a seed pack, um, you can see the length of time for germination. So right now I'm, I'm planting broccolini, which I love the flavor of this, it's so good. These will germinate in seven to 14 days. So what I want to do is look at my last frost date and I want to back into when I can plant these in the garden. So with these broccolini, I'd want to sow the seed and get them started about three to four weeks before that last frost date. Now, you can get one of these warming mats because the soil temperature is really important to get germination. About 75 degrees is what you want. And with water, you don't want to overwater them or wash the seed out of these plugs or containers. So just gently apply water. You want to make sure that the soil remains consistently moist, but not sitting in water, so it needs to be able to drain out. Now the little seed will actually germinate without any light, but light becomes very important once it actually uh, does germinate and break the soil. So at that point, you'll want to give it full exposure to sunlight. You can move it into a small greenhouse or a cold frame or even a place out on your patio. So if you're eager to get started gardening, why not begin with some seed planting? What I love about it is you can get your hands in the soil. It's very satisfying. But you can also grow specific varieties that you might not be able to find at the garden center. Give it a try. You don't have to garden very long to understand that knowing a little soil chemistry can go a long way with success in your garden. So why don't we take a moment for a little chemistry lesson using some natural materials, some things that you can find in your own kitchen. Now the pH of the soil is really important, particularly if you want to grow some vegetables, and I mean lots of great looking vegetables. So we're going to talk about whether the soil is slightly acidic or slightly alkaline. For growing vegetables, you want your soil to be slightly acidic. Now take for instance this. I've taken some red cabbage 
and created two jars of cabbage juice. Now we're using a red cabbage because, well, cabbages are neutral. On that scale from zero to 14, zero being the most acidic, 14 being the most alkaline, right at the middle, seven is neutral. So we're using some cabbage juice, which was made from boiling some cabbage with distilled water. And when you do that, you get cabbage water that's this color. Okay, now, if we take a neutral substance and we add vinegar, which, yes, is an acid, what happens is it goes pink. If we take cabbage water, which is neutral, and we add a base, in this case, baking soda, what happens is it turns blue. Now, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with my soil? Well, let me show you what you can do. If you're doing soil testing, in your garden, you usually wanna take some samples from various places. So here I've got four samples, but I'm just gonna use one to explain what I'm doing. Now I'm just gonna take about two little amounts of soil here from one place in the garden. And what I'm gonna do is take the cabbage juice, which remember is neutral, and I'm just gonna pour a little bit of this around in this saucer like that. And then I'm gonna stir that soil around and see what sort of reaction we get. And you can see it's already turning bluer, which means that it's slightly alkaline, all right? If this had been pink, that would mean my soil is slightly acidic. Now, you can see this is not a precise exercise or experiment, but it does give you an idea of roughly where your soil is in terms of pH. If you wanna be more precise, you can get a pH kit, or you can contact your local county extension service and they can take samples and give you a very precise reading of the pH of your garden soil. Now the reason for getting the pH right in your garden is that it makes nutrient uptake the most efficient for your plants. And when that's efficient, that means you're going to have a bountiful return. What if I told you you could bake your own cuticle cream and hand balm right in your own kitchen? I'm using the soy wax, I'm using cocoa butter, yummy, and I'm using coconut oil, and then this is almond oil. Take this wax and you're gonna reduce it down to a liquid by popping it in the microwave for 15 seconds and then stirring it and then popping it back in, back and forth, back and forth. So I'm gonna add four ounces here to this larger bowl and we're gonna pop it in the microwave. Okay, look at that, it's finally liquid, that's good. Now what you'll find, all microwaves are different. If you have a high wattage microwave, it's gonna cook faster. Okay, now what I'm doing is I'm adding the cocoa butter here, and in addition to that, I'm gonna add that six ounces of the coconut oil. I'm gonna blend this together, these chunks, and we'll pop it back in. Okay, now it's time to add just a little, well, flavor. And I'm going to use some lavender, because I love lavender. I'm gonna put about six drops. That was three, four, five, six. And then I'm just gonna take and dip this solution out and pour it into these little tins. From the garden home, I'm Alan Smith. Wow, you little guys are really coming along great. Hey, have you ever tried to grow some seedlings in your house and maybe they didn't go so well? Well, I've had the same experience and it's all about the light. You wanna get the light right. There's some other things as well, but light is so important. So you can see these little broccolini are coming along beautifully. And it's because they're getting an additional light that emulates nature. So an incandescent bulb or other types of light in your house, even light from a window isn't gonna be as good as, well, some of these grow lights. And they come in different forms. You can get a light like this, where it can just be clamped right over the plants, which works really well. But again, it's all about that bulb. Or one that's elongated, and you can see you can go across the entire tray. 
These bulbs emulate the sun, they emulate nature, and the plants, well, they really respond to it. Now let's talk about proximity, proximity of the lights to the plants. What you want is the light to be about two to three inches above these little seedlings. And as they grow, just raise the light up just a little bit. That's ideal for these little guys to continue to grow and be strong so you can eventually transplant them outdoors in the garden. Now you're probably asking yourself, just how much light should these little guys have? Well, I'm glad you asked. They need about 15 to 16 hours of sunlight. And just like us, they need a little sleepy time, about six hours of darkness. But you may be thinking, well, how am I gonna manage that? Well, you can actually pick up a little timer like this. I know it looks complicated, but it's really pretty easy. Light will come on, give them their 15 hours they need, go off, they can sleep, comes back on, and you get that cadence that feels like nature. And then you wanna consider temperature. You don't want it too hot, you don't want it too cold. I know it sounds like Goldilocks, but you know, the bottom line is, the temperature in your home, if you're comfortable, they're comfortable. Keep them away from drafty areas. And when it comes to moisture, just make sure that the soil is consistently moist. You don't want them to dry out and you don't want them to sit in water. Remember this transition from if you're comfortable, you can begin to move them out and get them planted in the garden and enjoy a lovely harvest throughout the growing season. Cabbage is a very hardy vegetable and that makes it easy to grow, and by the way, it's very cold tolerant. It's a leafy vegetable that's big and robust, so it's great looking in any garden. For best results, transplant small cabbage plants about 15 to 18 inches apart in rows that are 32 to 36 inches apart. Now you'll find that you can transplant cabbages in the very early spring, because like I said, they're cold tolerant. Cabbages generally prefer full sun, but will tolerate partial shade and you'll want to prepare a rich, loose soil that holds plenty of moisture. Now, when it comes to harvesting, you'll find that cabbage heads are ready when firm and when the interior of the head is dense. They can split if they become overly mature or if they've been exposed to too much water. Try planting some cabbages in your next garden project. Believe me, you'll be glad you did. Take a look at the way we did some planting here by having a little fun with lettuce varieties. What you see here is color blocking using romaine lettuce. This is red romaine planted next to green romaine. And by blocking them, you get this sort of, uh, well, bold presentation. There are about five rows of each of these colors. And then behind me, I offset the green on the opposite side. And here we have the red in the center. So as you can see, you can get creative and have a lot of fun in the garden. Now, if you look at the next raised bed over, you get this sort of blend of both colors of red and green through that beautiful red sail lettuce. So certainly I've convinced you that these lettuces are a feast for the eyes, but they also are great for the table. Now, one of the ways that I like to harvest romaine is that you can come around and you can just pick the outer leaves just like this, just pulling them off. You can see I'm just taking some of these that are just on the outside and leave the internal leaves. These are more mature um, and it just is a way to kind of keep lettuce coming along in the garden. Now the other way is to at some point just take the entire head of lettuce um, where I just cut it off right at the ground like this. Now that's the way we usually see it in the supermarket. And um, you can take this in and you can create a lovely salad with it. Or um, you can strip off a few more of the leaves like this. And then I love to take these and put a little olive oil on them and garlic and roast them on the grill. It makes a delicious salad with maybe a little Caesar dressing on top. Give it a try and bring a little art to your garden.